Maybe back door, maybe fall off. Sniffing codeine, cause I gotta kill a cow. Let me sit sideways in the big bins. Oh, you boys, they my brothers, they my friends. Now it's time to go to work. There's not one guy in the history of this program that's bigger than the program. <laughs> Listening to Brandon Drum. Look, I think the program is moving in a great direction. And Parker Thune. Venables knows what he's doing. This is the OU Insider Under the Visor Podcast. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another OU Insider Under the Visor Sooners Podcast. My name is Brandon Drum. I'm here with Parker Thune, and I know we've been gone for a very long time. Uh, over a month and a half, we've been traveling. We've been seeing a lot of different players, top recruits that Oklahoma's in on. We've been to seven on seven tournaments. We've been to camps. We've been to spring practices all over the United States. We've done it all to make sure you guys on OU Insider are informed. Uh, but we've also kept up the YouTube live. I know some of y'all would prefer the the podcast, but we're back and we are going to keep doing this weekly now that we're not going, going, going all the time. And are able to sit down and do our uh, our our hour or so podcast and talk about Oklahoma athletics with you guys on whatever platform you listen to us on. Uh, but also today we're recording this on a Wednesday night. It is 10 p.m. and the Oklahoma Sooners has just won five to one a couple hours ago uh, against Texas A&M, and they're going to the College World Series National Title Series. Our man Parker Thune has been there all week. And uh, he's in a call in a garage right now with some cars behind him. <laughs> that uh, is internet problems. That is correct. But we do what we can for you guys. Yes, that's correct. This is this is the one place in the house because obviously I'm back home in Omaha, staying with my family, and so this is the one place in the house where I have both a stable internet connection and insulation such that no one who is sleeping will be awakened by my by the carrying of my voice as I talk about OU Athletics. So yes, here I am in the garage at my parents' house podcasting for all of you uh, here on the OU In- Insider Under the Visor podcast. But yeah, I tell you what, OU doesn't seem too determined to send me back home to Norman anytime soon because they have nope. made this stay in Omaha a memorable one, and they're now two victories away from a national title. And Brandon, I mean, we talked about it on the live, but imagine telling anybody, imagine trying to convince anybody that OU's next national title in a major men's sport was going to be in baseball as recently as like a month ago. No, they were, they were struggling. They did their, their pitching was up and down. Obviously Kate Horton wasn't involved. He was coming back from Tommy John surgery. Now he's got his, uh, his slider going out of nowhere. He all of a sudden has a uh, 80 mile an hour slider back. And that thing is just humming. He's uh, talk about somebody that just up their draft stock. My goodness, man, Kate Horton. And I was, you know, watching people on Twitter today and those were about at the batting practice and all that this week. And they said that dude was just raking during batting practice too. Like he can just, he can hit some, some dingers for sure. Uh, so he's an all-around player. He's a guy that can do it all for Oklahoma. Uh, obviously, you got Peyton Graham that's doing really well. Uh, you got Trevor Michaels. You got uh, you got Bennett. You got uh, man, uh, just Sandlin. I mean, the, the the pitching staff is just it's just on right now. And then when you got Crooks, when you've got Graham hitting, uh, trying to think of Treadway. I mean, everybody seems to be. They uh, Oklahoma just peaked at the right time. I think that's the simplest way to put it. They peaked at the right time. They peaked when you want to peak. And, and we talked about this on the YouTube live. It, Skip Johnson has been recruiting so well for so long. A lot of his players have gone major league and those that have stuck around, he's developed 
and turn them into big time major league draft picks. So this, this program's not going to go anywhere anytime soon, especially when you see McGuire's kids coming through. I'm trying to think who else. I mean, it's like a who's who of former great baseball players coming through the, the stock at Oklahoma. So, I mean, this is not going to be the last time. I don't think you're going to see Oklahoma in the College World Series over the next few years. Yeah, They're well, young, too. They're very they, young. They are young. And you think about some of the key the cornerstone contributors in this lineup. Sure, you're probably not getting Jimmy Crooks back, probably not getting Peyton Graham back, and you're probably not getting Tanner Chetaway back. But Jackson Nicholas is a freshman. Wallace Clark is a freshman. John Spikerman, who's been a revelation in right field, is a freshman as well. Cade Horton, the ace of your staff at this point. Well, no, Jake, Jake Bennett's the he's, ace of he's your gonna staff. Be age, he's he, going to be old enough, didn't he, to be drafted? Cade is, right? No, Cade Horton has another year. So, okay, okay. Um, Cade Horton is going to be the ace of your staff at a certain point in time, uh, especially if Jake Bennett decides to make the jump. Uh, and then uh, you take a look at that bullpen. You got some arms there, some young Demon. arms some young arms that could be uh, key for this program moving forward. But you talk about a team peaking at the right time. That's really what it's about, Brandon. That's what it's about when you get to Omaha. Uh, once you're there, it's all about who's playing the hottest baseball. And right now, that's Oklahoma. And they seem inevitable, man. There is so There's so many different ways that this team can beat you. One through nine in that lineup, there is nobody that is a sure out. Blake Robertson just tied a program record for single season walks today so they are both patient and capable with the sticks they can hit for power they can hit for average or they can just wear you down and at the leadoff right like he's the leadoff better that's that's kind of a no robertson's right? the three hole robertson's okay, the three excuse hole. me excuse me the three hole that's what i meant the three hole excuse me that's unheard of at the three hole usually it's the cleanup that the walks a lot the three hole and and who was it who who's the who's the who's the uh leadoff Lead off is John Spikerman. He walks quite a bit as well, too. He does. Yeah. Sp I mean, Spikerman, he didn't, he didn't have his first at bat of the season until midway through the month of April. But yep. he's emerged in this starting lineup as a true freshman. And he's literally everything you could ask for in a leadoff hitter. If you had to mold your perfect leadoff hitter, in many ways, it would be John Spikerman because, yes, he works counts, he draws walks. He hits to all fields, and once he's on base, he's a terror on the base paths, arguably the Sooners' fastest runner. Him and Peyton Graham are two of the most dangerous runners in this entire CWS field. And as Oklahoma closes in on a national title, Brandon, I think what's most impressive is the fact that through three games at the CWS, Skip Johnson's only had to use two relievers, Jarrett Godman and Trevin Michael. And you've gotten three really good appearances at the end of ball games out of Michael, but... That says so much about the starting pitching and the distance and the length and the consistency that yeah. Johnson has been able to milk out of Bennett and out of Sandlin and out of Kate Horton. Now you head into a situation where you have Bennett lined up as your game one starter on Saturday. You have Kate Horton lined up as your game two starter on Sunday. And you know what? If it comes to game three on Monday, you got Sandlin fresh off the game of his life ready to take the ball, and you're going to have all hands on deck out of the bullpen. Everybody's going to be available. Everybody's going to be ready uh, to jump in and contribute in a game three if Oklahoma finds themselves in a win or die situation. But the way that they're playing baseball, Brandon, I don't even know if it comes to a game three, regardless of whether it's Ole Miss or Arkansas on the other side of the bracket. It just doesn't seem like – Tell me if I'm wrong here or not. And this is just like, obviously I watch baseball. I watch all you baseball during the season. I, I don't watch it like you do, but we've talked about it plenty on the podcast and on the YouTube lives. I, I think, you know, there's so OU fans out there like, well, finally, you know, people are starting to cover it. Bros, we've covered OU baseball from day one on this, on our, on our website. Well, yeah. And, and look, podcasts it, and YouTube it, lives. So and Wrong I think people what, here. <laughs> yeah. And I think what people, I, I think where that conversation originates is, oh, all of a sudden people are buzzing about OU baseball, right? Now all of a of sudden course. you see you see wall to wall coverage. And this is just the nature of the beast. You know, I'm a former baseball player and 
I am as aware as anybody of the reality of the baseball season, how long and grueling it is and how difficult it is, especially in those early spring months to get people to care about OU baseball. And Toby Rowland was saying it on the radio uh, the other day on his morning show, the reality that there are games where Oklahoma has a couple hundred fans out there for some home games. And that has to do with a lot of factors, right? It has to do with the weather. It has to do with the opponent. It has to do with the team itself and how much interest it's garnering. It has to do with the facilities and the environment, the experience at Eldell Mitchell park, which as we know is about to have a whole lot of money pumped into it, but I'm not at all surprised that people's interest in OU baseball is significantly heightened over the last few weeks because we can, we can call a spade a spade here. Nobody expected the Sooners to go this far. And to be mm. honest, this team wasn't really commanding headlines over the first couple months of the season, the way that they are right now. And if you have followed this team, you understand that that potential was always there. It was just a matter of stringing your best ball together and it wasn't clear when that was going to happen or if that was going to happen for the Sooners. Now it has happened. Now you've seen everybody buy in. You you see Skip Johnson completely at ease with every single decision he makes, knowing that whoever he throws into any given situation, that they're going to give them his, they're going to he's going to be able to get their best ball out of them. And as a consequence, you've seen some major pledges, major financial pledges to improve the future of OU baseball and enhance the overall fan experience, yep. which goes a long way towards driving season long fandom, season long interest and sustained investment from the fans perspective in the baseball program, because go back to field of dreams, Brandon, so many of those people who are complaining if on social media it, they will come. have never seen field of dreams because it's not, if they come, then you build it, right? It's, mm -hmm. If you build it, they will come. And and when you go the distance, people tend to follow. <laughs> correct. And so this this run is just what the doctor ordered for OU baseball because yeah, fan support had been lackluster the last couple mm -hmm. of years. And I think a lot of that had to do with the COVID-19 pandemic and how that killed the momentum that that program had yeah. because that 2020 team was going to be special. But in the aftermath, you lost some of your big – talent uh, some of your key talent some guys that uh, would bring fans out to the ballpark guys like Cade Cavalli who was must see TV every time he was on the hill and so I think there's been a recovery process that has had to take place in order to get people bought back into OU baseball but uh, this is a good thing for the program and yeah. nobody should be trying to detract or take away from that this is a good thing for the program it's a good thing to see people who have been borderline fringe fans of OU baseball in the past, starting to get more and more excited about this program. And I can tell you this much, Brandon, come this weekend when the Sooners play for a national title, Charles Schwab field is going to be packed with crimson and cream clad fans. Sooner fans have yeah. already traveled. Well, they will travel even better this weekend. Now that the Sooners know they're going to be playing for a title. They got I think this is, and people just think about this, like, and even I was sitting around after I was, after it happened and was taking my kids to go train for the football, their quarterback stuff this evening. And I was thinking about, it, I was like, if I'm thinking about going and packing my family up and going up to Omaha, think how many other people are doing it in Oklahoma. Think how many people in Kansas city that are Oklahoma grads that are like, and, and everybody or St. Louis or Chicago or where, wherever they're at, maybe they're from Arkansas or whatever. It's only like a six and a half hour drive from Oklahoma city. Number one, number two, Oklahoma winning on a Wednesday allows them to plan for the next three days to make it on the Saturday. That I think is the biggest little factor to the equation of the Oklahoma fans traveling is they have time now to make the reservations, to look for the hotels and not pay Disney-esque prices. You can go to Cedar Rapids or wherever. I can't, I'm trying to think of the, is that, is that the Iowa uh, suburb across from Omaha, right? Cedar Rapids, right? Council Bluffs. 
Council Bluff. There you go. See, I don't know. I'd have never really been up there all that much, but so Council Bluff and all that area, you could go there and go across the state borders and, you know, it's probably going to be cheaper, right? I mean, they have time to make those type of decisions. Maybe you want to stay in Kansas City and drive two hours up to Omaha. Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't know what you, what, what your plans are, but it's going to allow Oklahoma fans to really work this thing out and figure out what they want to do and how they want to attack going up and cheering on their Sooners. And I'm tell you this much, I think the prices are going to start dropping for the tickets. I think they're like 180 bucks a pop right now. I can imagine once Ole Miss and Arkansas finally, you know, that, that equation that one of them falls off because there's a lot of Ole Miss fans up there. I heard there's more of them than anybody. Uh, I think you're, you're going to see the prices drop and you're going to see Oklahoma fans really eat that stuff up. And, and it's definitely going to be crimson and cream. If Arkansas and Oklahoma are, <laughs> are playing, you're yeah. not going to know who's cheering on who. And until you see the logos on the fans hats. Yeah. Well, that and is that, true. And, or you see them go, woo, pick Sue or whatever. Yeah. They do. And, and um, one thing I want to add to t- kind of tie a bow on the conversation, as far as people uh, starting to care about OU baseball is this is the nature of the beast, man. This yeah. You have to think about this from the average fan's perspective. As a fan, if you make a conscious decision to go to a sporting event, take your family to a sporting event, you are making an investment. You are making an investment of money and you are making an investment of time. You have to convince yourself that the product you're going to purchase, in essence, the experience you're going to purchase is worth the investment. This happens with every single athletic program. This happens with every single team, collegiate, professional, or otherwise, across the globe. When you are playing good ball, people care more. When you are experiencing success, people care more because they will look at the success you're having and they will say, that is a program that is worth my investment of time and money to go and watch. When was Oklahoma football's attendance at its most dire low, Brandon? It was in the mid '90s when yeah. the Sooners sucked on the gridiron. That and was they still a- got sixty-five thousand people there a game. That's the crazy part. And it's seventy-two thousand seat stadium. So I mean, it, people still show up, right? They're going to show yeah, up, and people and people do still show up. But OU baseball win- even has a very loyal and very yeah. diehard contingent of fans that will show up to just about every single game. You will always have that contingent, but to the average fan, to the fan that isn't necessarily a diehard and that doesn't have the time or the money to be going to games every single uh, week, every single weekend, you usually have midweek game on a Tuesday or Wednesday, and then you have a weekend series Friday through Sunday. So when you don't have the time or the financial wherewithal to go to a baseball game three, four times a week, again, it's about what am I getting for my investment as a fan who has to pay for a ticket at the gate? And you see this phenomenon with every single fan base across the country. When their program is winning games, the stadium's going to be packed out. Mm -hmm. The crowd environment is going to be raucous, and it's going to be a daunting environment for an opponent. When your team isn't experiencing success, look no further than Kansas football. Right? It's, become, it, it's kind of become a running joke, the fact that nobody shows up to their football games. It's not hard to see why. It's not hard to figure yeah. why. It's because they're not good at football. This is the nature of the beast. It's simple economics. Yeah, and look, you were talking about, you know, the fans and, you know, not sometimes only a couple hundred people showing up. Look. When Oklahoma moves to the SEC, when Arkansas is in town or Tennessee or Auburn or Alabama or Georgia or Ole Miss, I mean, those are big baseball names. And when you have those in comparison to, and I don't, I'm not trying to put little people, but like Texas Tech or, you know, the Baylor or, you know, West Virginia, you know, they're not the biggest names when it comes to baseball. So that's not going to garner the attention that those other programs will get. And SEC baseball is like SEC football. You're talking about big time, 
baseball and it's going to make the eyes, it's going to make the product better. It's going to make everything seem greater because of the competition and where there's competition breeds, you know, iron sharpens iron. And that's why you see so many dominant SEC baseball programs because they're so good. The state of Oklahoma is one of the best baseball states there is out there. This is true. As far as when it comes to high school sports, I mean, it's not even close actually. And now that you have that, you're not going to have a lot of kids. I, I honestly feel as good as Oklahoma state stadium is and everything that they have going for them. I honestly feel bad for them because it's when the sec thing starts to roll around, skip Johnson takes them. They win a national title. Hypothetic. Let's say they do. Let's say they win a national title. Okay. This, this weekend, you had the sec equation of that. A lot of these kids that would be torn between Oklahoma State and OU that are top level talent that aren't going to be, you know, one through nine rounds in the in the uh, Major League Baseball draft and maybe going to be the later rounds, right? But they're going to be really good college players. Those kids are going to choose Oklahoma over Oklahoma State now, and it's not even going to be close because they're going to get to play against Arkansas. They're going to get to play against Ole Miss, Georgia, Florida, like really good baseball teams week in and week out, and that's going to raise the bar in Norman for everything else. And I think you're going to see that across the board in all sports. You're already starting to see it. They haven't even entered in basketball. You're starting to see some of the best players transfer to OU and men's and women's basketball. Softball was already happening, but it's becoming even greater. Now that you have the sec tied to Oklahoma over the next few years. I mean, this, this move to the conference, I think is helping Oklahoma by by a byproduct right now and we haven't even seen it take place yet and i think that's something people are like completely overlooking you're getting sec treatment and you're not even playing the conference yet because of what everybody knows you are about to be and that is just huge and you're starting to see donations show up because of it whether it's for baseball whether it's for basketball whether it's for softball uh specifically football i mean the bud wilkinson center is being dropped we're going to talk about that here in a little bit but they're tearing it down and you're talking about a $400 million facility being built. Like this is just crazy times in Norman right now. And it just, it just happened overnight. Basically it just, everything happened. It's kind of ironic. The time baseball started getting hot in late April around the OU spring game when everybody was showing up and everybody was raw, raw OU. And they were, you know, bringing all the teams out, whether it was softball, baseball, gymnastics, golf, and, you know, everybody's waving their hands and doing all that. The pageantry that you felt in that, even us as media that we felt during that spring game, you kind of sensed that there was something different going on in the athletic department and we're seeing it, whether it be softball, baseball, men's golf, women's golf, men's and women's gymnastics, men's and women's basketball. I know they, you know, the women were really good this year and they ended up going to wait the sweet 16 or second round. I can't remember which one it was. And then you have the men's team who got really hot early and then just couldn't find their footing after injury after injury happened later on in the season. You had transfer come out and we're going, Oh my gosh, what is, what is Porter Moser going to do? No, he's just going to be portal Moser again. And he's going to go out and get two of the best players in college basketball that are returning to come back to him and come on his team. I mean, that's where Oklahoma is at as an athletic department right now. And I think if you're a Sooners fan, you've got to be pretty proud of that. Right. I mean, it's just different. It just has a different feel. Um, let's talk like Kim Ray, $5.1 million to the, uh, to the baseball program announced yesterday. Uh, they got 28 million of the 42 million already announced. They're talking about breaking ground here the next few months. So LD Mitchell Park's about to get another huge upgrade. Uh, they're going to break ground here pretty soon on the, the, the softball that's already got. Go ahead. Quick aside, as part of the upgrade to LD Mitchell, can we please bring back natural grass, please? I don't know if it's the traditionalist in me, man, but come on. If, if Oklahoma is going to be a, if, if they if they go win a national title this weekend, if they're going to officially uh, adopt the moniker of a national title winning program, if that's what they're going to be in the year of our Lord 2022, man, you got to play on a national on a natural grass turf. You can't be playing on carpet. So, again, maybe that's just the baseball traditionalist of me. But when L Dale gets a facelift, I would love to see actual dirt and grass come back. 
Yeah, I'm kind of with you. I like I like the lines. Like I, I've always been kind of a big deal. Like when you see the the different shade color of lines and, and kind of the cool configurations you can do if you have a really good landscaper working for your athletic department, which Oklahoma does. He's got he's literally one of the best in the world. Yeah. Well, and who knows? Jason Fairs may be listening to that yeah. saying, "No, no, no, that's more work for me. Stop." <laughs> No, he's he's pretty unbelievable what he does uh, he but yeah no i'm a, i'm a big i'm a big fan of all that uh but you know softball as well huge donation loves donating 12 million dollars when originally it was supposed to only be nine uh they're going to start breaking ground on the new softball facility on a already dominant program going to have the best facilities in all of college softball going to have the best facilities all in college baseball i mean they're taking off at oklahoma and then when you roll around and look at what they're doing with the uh, the football program, the buds are getting torn down right now. We can talk about that real quick. Uh, you and I have discussed uh, a couple of recruits we've talked to have gotten to see kind of what Oklahoma is about to do over there. And they said, and I quote, it's the most futuristic thing they've ever seen. And one of the coolest Oklahoma is by far going to have the best facilities when it's over. And that's something Venables has been fighting for. When you go back to Sooners in the desert, he got up there and I was told people were like throwing their check, checkbooks at him because they were so hyped up about the athletic department, everything that he wanted to do with the football program. And you continually hear more and more donations, obviously oil being really high right now in the state of Oklahoma. That's helping. Everybody's got money right now, especially the big donors. Except so those helping. of us that have to pay for gas. Those of us that have yeah, to pay for yeah. gas do not have money that's right true. now. That's true. I come from an oil family, so I kind of enjoy it. That's kind of my inheritance. So I'll take it. Uh, so yeah, it's a, I apologize for that, but yeah, it's true. Um, grew up around the oil business. I was actually in it for a long time, but yeah, it, seriously though, the, the money, it, the, Brent kind of hit it like right at the perfect time. And with what's going on, the oil boom and all that type of stuff. I mean, it's, it's a great time for Oklahoma as far as donations go and stuff like that. But you have to win when that stuff's happening. Baseball's done it. Softball's done it. Basketball, they're talking about doing something with that arena at some point in time. They've got to fix it. I mean, it's – it's really Noble's such trash. I'm just going to say it's a piece of crap. So I, I love the, the, uh, the practice and training facilities, the Griffin and all that. That's some of the best in the country. Yeah, well – The actual with arena is off. Yeah, well, it wasn't designed to be a basketball arena. It just kind of, oh. it just kind of happened to be one. It just yeah. kind of, they they had to put, they had to move out of McCassum Fieldhouse. No, okay, Lloyd Noble's big enough. We'll play basketball there. But they need to redo that and just make it. They need to redo McCaslin and just build over top of it and do kind of like what they did with Gallagher Iba and see if they can't make it kind of a really intimidating center of the uh, university kind of a pit i mean i think more people would show up because they could just walk to it instead of having to take those those buses to get there i think that's the biggest issue you have with student participation is they can't just walk out their dorm or their frat house and get right to lloyd noble it's a jaunt man no it it's is an actual and jaunt no I, I i tell you what i'm kind of an authority on this topic because yeah i i lived on campus at ou for two years and didn't purchase a parking pass either of those two years so i would park my car at the noble center because you could park there without a parking pass you still can to my knowledge and that is a walk man that is a haul <laughs> it is at least a 20 minute walk and the mccaslin field house by contrast just a short little jaunt up the South Oval. So I can, I can tell you, speaking from experience, as somebody that had to make that walk to the Noble Center or the bus ride in some cases, if it was cold outside, it is so much easier to get to the field house than it is to get to Lloyd Noble. And if I am putting myself in the shoes of 18, 19-year-old Parker, for me as a student, as somebody who on a January, February night in 45 degree weather has a choice to either go to McCaslin for a sporting event or Lloyd Noble for a sporting event, I'm generally going to favor McCaslin. And so I like Lloyd Noble as a venue. I do. I like yeah. it. It is, Concert. it's a cool environment. And 
I, it's, I, I guess it's just kind of be what I've become used to, but it would drive student engagement and student attendance. If you moved, if you found a way to expand McCaslin and move basketball back over there, because let me tell you, there are at least a couple thousand students on that campus who are living in the residence halls that are that they were, whereas they won't make the 20 minute walk to Lloyd Noble, they will make the five minute walk to McCaslin. That will be enough yeah. to get them in the doors. Yeah, no, I agree. I think that's something everybody's been talking about for years. And I know they've done, you know, surveys and researches and to see what they can do. It's just, nothing's ever come to fruition with it. And I, I, I hope here in the near future, they, they can, I think it's just when you put so much money into the practice facility and the training facility and you have it hooked up to Lloyd Noble, it's hard to detach yourself from that when your offices are there and your arena is all the way across town and say you want to go practice, right? You want to practice. We're talking practice, man, practice, but say you want to practice and then you want to work out. Well, it's easy at the Lloyd Noble because you practice and then you go up there and you work out. Well, now if you got to go do a shoot around and you got to go to the game, you're going to go do a shoot around at the practice facility, hop, change your clothes, hop in the car, then go to McCaslin to play your game. I, that just doesn't make a lot of sense. And I get where everybody's coming from, but if that's your only really hold up, do it. I mean, I don't think that's going to be the biggest holdup in the world that can, I don't know. I, I, I we're, we're totally talking about a completely different thing here, but anyways, facilities are going up everywhere on the Oklahoma campus. And I think OU fans, if you want to continue to donate, obviously you go to Soonersports.com, you go to the, the donation part and you can do whatever you need to do to help Oklahoma continue to build the athletic facility. Uh, we have to get that part in. Um, Recruiting, 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 recruiting. Everybody wants to say it's been such a slow time for Oklahoma recruiting. And I'm going, what in the world are y'all talking about? They've had three commits in the last two weeks. I was about to say, three. Brandon, it's been, uh, yeah, three, three commits in the month of June. So if this is a slow time, I think it, it, maybe that's just maybe that's the newbies on the board that don't understand how this works year in and year out. But it's like, if, if this is a slow time to y'all, you're going to be pretty disappointed by the rest of the recruiting calendar because things are heating up for the Sooners. They've already yeah. heated up in the month of June with three commits to date and July, man, July is looking like it's going to be big. Yeah. Well, uh, let's talk about that. Obviously, <sighs> You have Caden Green announcing on July 8th. You have Phil Picciotti announcing at some point in time in July. You have Jacoby Johnson announcing before the football season starts. You have Peyton Kirkland announcing on July 23rd. You have Derek LeBlanc switching it back to July. And you and I both think Oklahoma is going to be the pick at this juncture. So uh, and obviously we're not going to put a crystal ball in because – well, I, I, I'm not. I'm not putting one in. I'll put it to you like that. And there's reasons why I'm not doing it. Uh, people on the board understand why, but because you know he's it. going to Florida, Brandon. That's why. That's why. That's why. That's why. People don't sense the sarcasm there. I don't know what to do. But no, I mean it is a battle between Oklahoma and Florida. I think he was supposed to visit Miami this weekend, and I'm not sure that's going to take place. I need to talk to Derek and his dad about that. I don't. I don't know for sure. Uh, Florida, Oklahoma, Penn State, Miami. Uh, those four teams seem to be really battling out for Derek LeBlanc. I, we were shocked when we saw that he was going to announce in July. But when I talked to other people, everybody's like, no, not a big deal. Not a big deal. You know, uh, I still expect the official visit to Oklahoma to happen. Now, that doesn't mean anything, obviously. I mean, he could commit to Florida and take an official to Oklahoma in September and decide, yep, that's still not for me. I'm going to go to Florida. I mean, seriously, like, that's how recruiting works. Like, you never know with these kids. And I think that with Derek being so highly recruited, this thing is far from over no matter what happens, no matter who he commits to. It's a long ways off from being over. I think Oklahoma fans need to do that. But 
I, and and when I say we we would we think he's going to Oklahoma, I think that's kind of an over exaggeration. Let me let me backtrack there. I like where Oklahoma stands. I don't think he's going to Oklahoma. I think we would pick that just because. I don't know why I would pick that honestly. I think Florida is just so right there that. Hmm. Now that I'm actually thinking about it in my mind, I mean, he's visited Florida so many times. He was just there again today for seven, ten times. seven, ten Florida visits, ten times total, ten Florida, Florida visits total. That is amazing. Like if Oklahoma fans, if you're not nervous, I don't know what's, what, what, what you're doing there, man. Like you should be super nervous. So, um, I, I, I like Oklahoma's chances, but at the same time, you have to like Florida's chances too. I mean, they've done a really good job recruiting him, done a really good job recruiting him. And we're not going to put in, I'm not going to put a crystal ball in because I mean, he could go to Florida. He could not go to, we could go to Oklahoma. I mean, I, I know I'm sitting here riding the fence, but there's a reason why I'm riding the fence because it's, I think it's that close. I think it's that close. Yeah. Well, and I kind of, kind of my philosophy on it uh, all the way throughout the recruitment has been like, it, it makes sense that he's dropped by Florida and Miami as many times as he has, right? Cause it's yeah. not that far of a drive. Um, no, nope. the type of drive you can make there and back on any given Saturday. Uh, once school is out and once you got some downtime, you know, head down there on a Saturday, head back that evening. It's a quick, easy trip. Um, in Oklahoma's case, Derek LeBlanc has been to OU. What is it? Six times now, Brandon yeah. on his own yeah. dime. And I'll continue to say it, man, when you are investing that much time and that much money into going to one particular school, not a whole bunch of schools, but one particular school that is over a thousand miles from home, that would suggest that at the very, very least, that interest is more than legitimate. So yeah, I, I, I am, I, I'm believing at this point in time that Oklahoma, if they're not the front runner to land Derek LeBlanc, they're right there with Florida. I'm with you, Brandon. Yep. And I, I, I'm not going to put a crystal ball in either just because I think that recruitment has seen enough twists and turns and it's shrouded in just enough mystery that nobody in any camp is going to be a hundred percent certain no. where he's going <laughs> until the day that he commits. I like nobody, nobody will have 100% confidence that Derek LeBlanc is going to any particular school. So uh, I, I'm going to hold back on a prediction for that reason as well, but uh, I do think for OU fans that are already conceding this race to Florida and Miami by virtue of proximity and the fact that, well, Oklahoma just doesn't get that caliber of player from the state of Florida. No, there's a very good chance that Oklahoma ends up with Derek LeBlanc. Very good chance yeah. that he is a sooner. Yeah. And if that happens, tip of the cap to Todd Bates. Yeah, dude, could you I, – I, I... Just because we've covered Oklahoma long enough, or particularly myself, long enough as far as defensive recruiting goes, the change in mentality that his commitment would bring would be pretty substantial. It would be kind of a awakening to the rest of the nation that Todd Bates and Brent Venables are – bringing Oklahoma defense back to where it was up until about 2015. And that has got to scare some of the nation. I think if you're a Florida fan right now, you're nervous about Oklahoma. If you're a OU fan, you're nervous about Florida with Derek LeBlanc. Um, and I think obviously this goes without saying that, we're talking about his son, but, and we know that he's going to be listening to this. So we got to give the shout out to Ricardo LeBlanc, who's going to text me when he hears all this. I'm like, Oh, you know, and we talk about, you know, this type of stuff all the time, but like, it, it really is like, it's been such a, it, he, he has treated, I want to, I want to say this really quick. He has treated Derek's recruitment really spectacularly because he's allowed Derek to visit so many places 
and it to be his decision. Like it doesn't matter the distance. It doesn't matter anything. Like Ricardo has literally been, he wants his kid wherever he's comfortable. You know, if that means he's going to take trips to a lot of different places, then that so be it. He's going to work to provide to make sure they make those trips. And I, I bow down. I hope if my kids ever become that, I can do that for them as well. So that I think that's a really cool thing when you get to see that from their perspective and talk to them about their ideology and how they've dealt with the recruiting process and the LeBlancs have dealt with it really well. And I think it's really cool that he's decided also, like he originally wanted to announce on July 23rd. It sounds like that's probably going to be the date or close to it uh, with his buddies, um, Lake Bryant and Peyton Kirkland, the four-star offensive lineman that Oklahoma's in on, and obviously the five-star edge rusher uh, from IMG that a bunch of programs are in on right now. So I, you know, I don't, I don't want to sit here and say we know where he's going because we don't. That would be a big lie. We have no idea where Derek LeBlanc's going to go. We can sit there and guess. But that's all it is, is a guess at this point, because like you've said, Parker, it's been such a back and forth recruitment between Florida, Miami and Oklahoma and Penn State getting an official visit too. And he's visited Penn State, I think, two other times. So they're obviously in on this as well. So it's like a four team race right now. You can throw Alabama, Georgia and all these a couple other programs, Tennessee in there. He's visited unofficially. So there's all these programs they visited. We'll just see at the end of July where this thing stands. Um, I, it's gonna be it's gonna be a flip of the coin. Honestly, it's gonna be a flip of the coin, and we'll cover as best we can. And I, I'm I'm gonna try to come down there and be there for the announcement as well. So, regardless of where he goes, we're gonna be there covering it one way or the other. I think. Um, also on the recruiting front, uh, July when you talk about it being a big month, I think the last. So I think there's like a 10 or 13 day period where you can host recruits at the end of July. And from my understanding, there might be two big weekends. It's not confirmed, nothing set in stone, but we do know that unofficially Tuasilia Khan is going to be there. The four-star edge rusher out of Utah, formerly from Hawaii knows obviously Jocelyn Allo Dylan Gabriel, all those people. Uh, so Oklahoma's in a really good spot because of the Hawaiian connection at OU uh, with two Silicon Parker obviously was the first to report that. Uh, that's on July 29th. I think that date in particular could be a big day for 2023 recruits. And I think the 23rd or 24th could be really big for 2024 recruits. Nothing's confirmed, but do not be shocked if you see several big name 24 and 23 recruits back on campus in July, just throwing that out there, throwing that out there. I know Charles Lester is going to be one on the end of July. He's coming in uh, KJ Bolden, uh, Jalen and Bakway is looking to be coming in as well. Five-star defense. Both those are five-star defensive back in Bakway and Bolden. Um, trying to think who else. Uh, King. Uh, oh my gosh. Just went blank. King just Joseph. King Joseph looks to be coming back as well from what I understanding. Uh, so Oklahoma really hit the nail on the head there. I mean, I think they, I think they're in a good spot for that, that kid. I, surprisingly, shockingly in a good spot, especially if that visit comes to fruition again. Um, I'm on my understanding. There's a couple of other Texas, Florida, Georgia, 2024 recruits, Alabama recruits that are going to become out. KV on Henderson might be one of them as well. Uh, trying to think i think uh david stone obviously Xavier sims like all these players could be coming up for the big 2024 day 2023 day i think you could be seeing uh oh my gosh uh maybe ryan yates who was just offered by oklahoma here recently uh the teammate who was just offered it should be announced by the time this podcast comes out it will be announced it will be announced it's already on ou insider so the OU Insider people already know about it. And I reported that it was probably going to happen in my notes earlier today. Uh, Ryan just texted me and said, I'm announcing it on Thursday morning. So he's going to announce Thursday morning. Obviously, teammates of Jackson Arnold, five-star OU QB commit. 
also teammates of four-star Notre Dame safety commit Peyton Bowen, who just so happens to be really high on Oklahoma as well. So that one could get really interesting. Yates is committed to LSU. That's something to watch folks very much. So, um, Oh my gosh. Uh, trying to think of a couple of other safety targets that I feel like are going to be coming in at the end of July. Uh, I think Hussey's one of them. Um, gosh, dang, I went blank on his name, by the way, the first name, but, uh, do you got the? Do you remember his first name? Because I sure don't. Conrad Hussey. That's who you're thinking. Conrad Hussey. Conrad Hussey. There you went. I just went freaking blank, bro. Conrad Hussey is one that I would say that uh, most likely will be visiting Oklahoma at the end of July if that that date comes to fruition. Uh, same as Marvin Burks. Marvin Burks out of St. Louis, uh, Cardinal Ritter Prep, uh, four star safety Oklahoma offered here over the last month or so. He he. As well, sounds like he could be visiting Oklahoma at the end of July. So my point is, is that just because July 4th through like the 20th is like super dead or the 18th or whatever, just relax, Sooner fans. It may be dead with visits, but I think commits are going to start rolling around around that time. And I think you're going to like what you see. I really do. I think Oklahoma fans are going to like the month of July and the month of August. And I think you're going to like the ending class. I think Oklahoma is going to end up with a top four to 10 class when it's all said and done. And I, I stick by that, especially with who they're in on, who they have chance to close in on and where they stand with those players. So this is, this is far. I mean, Macari Vickers, we haven't even talked about Macari Vickers, Parker, Macari Vickers, 50, 50 chance between Oklahoma and Alabama. And I think Alabama has a couple of other players that they may have higher than Vickers, and Oklahoma has really pressured that in. Jay Valai has been really hard at that. And there's a lot of people that think Vickers and Jacoby Johnson could be Oklahoma's quarterback. Cornerback guys at the end of this class. I am one of those people, Brandon. I, uh, I have a crystal ball in for both players in favor of Oklahoma. And the one thing you got to keep in mind with Makari Vickers is the Keon Brown connection. And yep. that was that was the biggest surprise of a commitment in quite a while for Oklahoma when Keon Brown announced in favor of the Sooners at the beginning of June. And that has the potential to pay dividends beyond just what Jordan Keon Brown. Brown is at face value, which is a six foot three, 190 pound wide receiver that has shot onto the scene as a nationally regarded prospect over the last few months. Keon Brown is pushing very hard to get Macari Vickers and Norman with him. He's going to push very hard to get Jordan pride. Another Tallahassee area blue chip. We'll be back in July, class. by the way, from what I'm told. And he, yes, he will be back in July. Uh, that's another guy that Keon Brown said he's going to push hard to get uh, in Norman with him eventually. So the Florida pipeline might not start and stop with IMG. And the Sooners are going to be, they're going to be in good position to get some dudes from IMG. And obviously uh, David Stone is kind of the guy that you're hoping opens the pipeline in that regard. But the fact that we're sitting here in June, Brandon, and talking about legitimate opportunities for Oklahoma to go and get Derek LeBlanc and Makari Vickers and to already have gotten Keon Brown, like you are seeing Venables and this new Oklahoma staff cut their teeth Peyton immediately Kirkland. in the state of Florida. Peyton Kirkland, there's another one. We can go on. These are far from the only players Oklahoma's recruiting from the state of Florida and far from the only guys that they have a legit chance to get out of the state of Florida. But the fact that we are having this conversation speaks to just how quickly this new staff has worked to build those inroads and maintain those relationships in the Sunshine State. Yeah, and I mean, the, an, another player that uh, I would sit here and probably say Oklahoma has a really good chance to at least get a visit out of in July is Zaquan Patterson, the four-star safety out of Shamanon Madonna in Fort Lauder or Hollywood, Florida. And his teammate, Jeremiah Smith, could be coming back up as well in July. So, I mean, there is a lot of stuff going on with Oklahoma that – OU fans may not realize, and they may say, oh, my gosh, it's dead. Well, it's dead because the coaches are out of town. 
Uh, they're not taking a lot of visits. They're taking visits here or there, you know, doing little tidbit things around the office. But a lot of times they're in and out. They're going to hang out with family. Uh, Venables likes to do the Clemson deal where they get kids to come and visit early throughout the first, you know, 20 days of the month of June. And then the June 20th through July 10th, they're gone. They're going to be with family. They're going to do what they need to do to make sure their families are happy because the job takes so much out of them and takes so much time. And then they're going to get right back at it and start recruiting again. It worked for Clemson. It's going to work for Oklahoma. It's another blue blood. They're still recruiting. Don't get them wrong. Like they're still talking to people on the phone. They're still FaceTiming. They're still doing what they've got to do to stay in contact and make sure they're doing the right things on the recruiting trail with these guys. But at the same time, they're, they're taking a step back and doing the, the, the family deal too. And who can blame them? Parker, you and I can sit there and tell everybody just how demanding our job is when it comes to recruiting too, because we're two people covering all positions 23 through 26 right now and they've got a whole 40 something people in there to do that for them and it's hard on them so think about us as well so it, I, we don't blame them for what they're doing i know fans want to see them work 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 and get commit 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 and it just be steady all the time it doesn't work like that these people that are hot right now, clemson's hot right now they're going to hit a lull and then the clemson fans a few months are going why have we got to commit in like three months well you got them all in june it's going to stop at some point. So you could either get them now and lull during the season, or you can get them in July through October and have a really good four month run at commits and then end really hot on national signing day as well, potentially. So I think that's kind of Oklahoma's plan. And I think they're, they're going to be pretty successful at it. I, I like where Oklahoma stands with a lot of really good talent right now. So yeah, I, 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 I think we're on the same page, Parker, and that we both feel Oklahoma is going to get really hot starting in July. And it's already kind of teetered towards that as June's gone along with the last three weeks getting three commits. Yeah, I mean, let's just I, off the top of my head here, guys that could potentially announce in July, if not sooner, or will definitely announce in July, if not sooner. Caden Green, Peyton Kirkland. Derek LeBlanc, Dalen Smothers, PJ Adabare, um, Phil Picciotti, Petaway. Jaquez Petaway. How about that one? We haven't even really touched on that. No, I was going to go. Oh, well, let's go. Let's go. Okay. Real okay, quick. Come on. I'll, t I'll, I'll, t I'll talk about Adams, Jaquez, and uh, Anthony Evans real quick. Anthony Evans' birthday was today, obviously, uh, June 22nd. I have to look down on my watch real quick. Um, and I was talking to him, you know, I, Oklahoma's in a really good spot for him, by the way. And I think when you talk to, when I talk to sources that know the recruitment, that know how that's gone, it's hard to not pick Oklahoma. When you look at how his recruiting opened up, the four-star out of Converse Judson High School, I mean, he, he was committed to Arkansas, quietly visited, quietly visited Oklahoma comes back down announces in the middle of the week he's going to decommit from arkansas and this on april 15th because he got no u offer right as he left the campus turns right back around and visits oklahoma again unofficially for the spring game then comes back again for champion barbecue with his family not literally a month and a week later or so and that right there i think was what really turned the heads of Evans and his family, because they were talking to Oklahoma staffers from what I was told. And this came from Evans. It came from, you know, people around the sources and all that type of stuff. And basically they were like, look, Oklahoma selling them on the idea of you have Dylan Gabriel, who's got a few years left. He may not leave after this year. He's got two or three years left on it to be able to play. You got, uh, Jackson Arnold, a five-star uh, quarterback coming in from Denton Geyer in your class. The 2024, you have a chance to have a couple of four or five stars that Oklahoma's in on right now as well come in. So the quarterback room, when and then you had obviously General Booty, you had 
uh, Davis Beville. I mean, you've got a lot of talent in that quarterback room already. And you've got a guy that's already thrown for 8,000 yards and 70 plus touchdowns and only 14 interceptions to start off if he decides to return. Or you can lean on one of those other guys I just named. Uh, you're in pretty good shape if you were a wide receiver. So they sold them on that. They're selling them on that, excuse me. And they're going, they're selling them on the idea of him being one of two or three big name wide receivers. When Oklahoma has been really good offensively, they've had two or three guys that they feel like they could get out in space and do little things with, uh, whether it was Hollywood Brown, Mark Andrews and CD lamb, whether it was, uh, Mark Andrews, GD Westbrook and, uh, Sterling Shepard. I mean, those were the type of things that they've sold them on. And then you get maybe a Cole Adams who came in there and said, I talked to him the other day. He said, look, Arkansas made this a really tough deal. Right. He said he, he when he went to Alabama, he's like, man, it's Alabama. They have everything. They got the facilities. Oh my goodness. This was an amazing place. I wanted to commit, but he knew in his head, he wanted to go see Oklahoma. Then he went, Oh my gosh, I was at Oklahoma. They're building such amazing facilities. The staff I believe in, I think they're going to win a lot of games and compete for national titles and the way they want to use me like Debo Samuels, the 49ers. He said, how could you not want to play? That's the same way I get used at Owasso. Then, uh, I mean, so Oklahoma's in a really good spot. I feel like Oklahoma's going to get Cole Adams. I feel like Oklahoma's going to end up with Evans. And I feel like Oklahoma's going to end up with Petaway. Uh, at the end of the day, when you add that, because in, they needed those small scat back slot guys because you just got added size. Brown. Yeah. You just had a Brown six foot three. You got the guys in 2022, whether it was, uh, you know, Javion Hester out of the transfer portal, whether it was LV uh, Bunkley Shelton who, or Shelton Bunkley, whether, uh, I mean, uh, he's only six foot, but that's still not a short wide receiver by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, he can play multiple positions. You've got um, Jaden Gibson as well, who's six foot four. So they've got plenty of guys that have got linked. They needed those, you know, five eleven, five nine guys that you can get out in space that are just going to blow by you. They need those type of guys, and those are the type of guys they're going after in twenty twenty three. And I think they have a really good spot. Michael Harrison Pylon is one I think Texas is actually making a big surge for. I think uh, uh, Brennan Marion has done a fantastic job for Texas making Oklahoma really work. He pushed back his commitment date. I don't know that he's going to get to that because I don't know that he's ever going to get to that visit to Oklahoma at this point. And it may be by design for him or maybe by design by Oklahoma. We really don't know. But either way, the way Brendan Marion's recruited him has made it very difficult on Kel Gunny and the rest of the Oklahoma staff when it comes to that. So, I mean, it, it's not like Oklahoma's winning every battle. They're losing some as well and have lost some. This has just been how things have ended up. Uh, worked out in their favor more often than not. Potentially, let me say, it has potentially worked out in their favor more often than not, as long as Oklahoma can close out the deal in July and August with those guys that we just talked about. Uh, but go ahead. I mean, those are guys that could announce. Uh, Jacoby Johnson's another one. Uh, I know you got a couple more that you feel like could announce in the month of July and August as well. Yeah, well, I mean, and you talked about Jaquez Petaway. Both you and I put in OU crystal balls for him today. So uh, that is a recruitment in which OU has established a very tangible, very significant lead at this point. It's going to be hard for them not to get Jaquez Petaway at this rate. Uh, but, uh, Logan Howland, Jaden Chapman on the offensive line, two guys that are mm -hmm. both nearing a decision. Uh, OU just made another offensive line offer tonight. And this could get very interesting because there are some family ties to Oklahoma uh, with this offer as well. Hopefully, I'm going to say this name correctly. Heath Ozaita out of Washington, three-star offensive lineman. Uh, Snoqualmie, hopefully I'm saying this right. I, I have no idea what the regional pronunciations are like up in the Pacific Northwest. So, uh, But he has taken official visits to UCLA, Stanford, and Utah Per our Brandon Huffman, however, mom is originally from Oklahoma, and it's her family's mm. school. So that could be one worth watching over the next few weeks as well if Oklahoma is able to get him uh, on campus for an official visit. And he was on campus for an unofficial earlier today per his Twitter. So uh, that 
that one certainly is worth a look as well uh, as far as the offensive line is concerned. The Sooners did not end up with Bryson Sanders. Uh, mm. They did not end up with Wilkin Formby either. Which that one, I don't know if that's going to be over with. I don't think that that recruitment's over with by any stretch of the imagination. You're talking about Sanders or Formby? Formby. And I know he's from Alabama. He's committed to Alabama. But let's say Alabama ends up with three other guys rated higher than him at offensive tackle. Could that make form be, I guess, question? I mean, I, I was just told this by somebody around Norman. At no point is Oklahoma going to give up on that because I still think they have a fighting chance. Wow. Okay. So, there you go. That's what I got. So, okay. Maybe, <laughs> so, maybe. We'll see. <laughs> Okay. National signing day is not till December, so we'll see. And will conform he's a top 100 player nationally. So uh, that is a dude. And if you've if you've seen video of him going up against other blue chip talent on the camp circuit, uh, he is a I stone I've seen it. wall. He is a stone yeah. wall. So uh, perhaps if that one starts to trend back in Oklahoma's direction, even with the commitment to Alabama, that's I, that's a guy you would love to have. You would love yeah. to have. No, I think he sticks. I'm just saying that Oklahoma is not by any stretch giving up on that from what I'm told. So, okay. Just so, yeah, I, I think the, uh, oh yeah, Samuel Masigo, another one uh, that shouldn't yep. take too much longer to decide. He's on his official visit to Florida this weekend. And I, I still favor Oklahoma in that one. Uh, I think Oklahoma holds a pretty significant lead. Uh, but that linebacker situation, that's one thing that we've talked about on the live. We haven't really had the chance to talk about it on the podcast, Brandon. Sooners might have to turn some dudes away at linebacker at this rate because yeah. they are in it for a whole bunch of dudes at that position. Yeah. I mean, Picciotti, Omosigo, obviously Lewis Carter. Uh, Whit Weeks. With weeks, I mean, Oklahoma surprisingly still feels really good about their chances with him. And I'm just like, his brother goes to LSU, but I don't know. I mean, yeah. Well, then you got the two big fish and Anthony Troy Hill and Bowles. Troy Bowles. Yeah. So, I mean, the, it's going to get interesting. Uh, I could see Oklahoma taking three or four linebackers. I could see them only taking two, depending on how things, you know, land at the end of the day. But the fact that they have that type of option shows you the difference in where things are when you have Brent Venables and Ted Roof coaching linebackers. And I'm not saying because Brian Odom did such a good job. He built the linebacker room that is so talented right now up. Uh, but he did it by going after, you know, one or two guys and really getting them because he was such a good recruiter. Venables is just so good at his job and has developed so many linebackers. They basically just come to him. It's just kind of, it's kind of a different dichotomy than anything that they've ever had at Oklahoma in a while. Well, since he was the linebacker coach at Oklahoma, it's just completely different. So yeah, it, it's going to, however this thing lands come national signing day, you expect Oklahoma to have two, but you wouldn't be shocked that for them to have three or four of the seven guys that they're in on at this point. And I think the, the encouraging thing to Oklahoma fans should be, as you look across that landscape of the linebacker position, you look at those guys that Oklahoma has offered and is actively recruiting. There's nobody on that list where it feels like you're settling for them. Uh, you, you'd be yeah. thrilled to get any and all of l those linebackers. And obviously, Anthony Hill and Troy Bowles probably carry a little bit more weight uh, for the average fan than somebody like Phil Picciotti or Whit Weeks just because it's going to affect the recruiting ranking more. It's going to affect the team composite score more. But at the end of the day, if you've watched the tape on any of those guys, you know uh, <laughs> it's not as if, oh, you know, swing and a miss with somebody like Lewis Carter. Well, I guess we got to settle for Whit Weeks. No, Whit Weeks is a guy and everybody across the board is a guy uh, that is capable of playing very high level football at the university of Oklahoma. He just visited with, Georgia. Yeah. And with, and with Brent Venables penchant for development at that position, when you combine the natural talent that every single one of those guys has with the type of coaching that they're going to get at OU, 
you are not going to have a miss in this class at the linebacker position. I tell you what, Brandon, uh, I was talking to a pretty plugged in source on the Nebraska high school football scene uh, up here this afternoon. And uh, this person, I mean, has connections all across the state, uh, played high school football, played college football in the state. And so uh, he's, he's has some degree of familiarity with pretty much every single player of note from all across Nebraska. And uh, I tell you what, un, unprompted, he brought up McIntyre to me and just said, Hey, look, Oklahoma got a steal in Cade McIntyre. I mean, they stole him. That is a guy and his older brother, Koa, who's a three-star safety that's committed, uh, actually enrolled now at Wyoming is the exact same way. Those two dudes flew so far under the radar, it's not even funny. And it's probably only because they played small school ball. But that, uh, that source told me, look, Cade McIntyre is as mean as a snake on the football field. And people are going to knock him probably because of the small school competition. He said, look, I understand that there are going to be concerns about how his game transitions to the next level. But I tell you what, you put that kid in a competitive environment against any any of his peers and just watch what happens because he is among the toughest hardest nosed grittiest football players and fiercest competitors you will ever come across and uh, in talking to that source he said look Cade McIntyre can go to Oklahoma and play wide receiver play tight end he'll be just fine at either of those positions but uh, one of the things that I talked to Kate about when I went out to Fremont yesterday, actually, is the fact that uh, if there's a clear path to playing time for him at outside linebacker, if the staff feels he's a better fit there, they're going to move him over the linebacker room. Even if it's crowded, if they feel like Cade McIntyre can compete for playing time, they're not going to hesitate to have him switch sides of the football. And in speaking with this source, that was one thing he brought up as well. Hey, if Cade McIntyre gets moved to outside linebacker, he's going to be a monster. And you watch the tape and you hear things like that and you almost can't help, but feel a little bit of a Danny Stutzman vibe about Cade McIntyre. And it's funny because Danny Stutzman actually hosted Cade on his official visit earlier this month. But, you know, you think about two dudes that were relatively lightly recruited, had some power five offers, but no real big time offers. Then all of a sudden, boom, Oklahoma jumps onto the scene. They offer him. He's committed. He's locked in. You turn on the tape. They're two guys. Danny Stutzman, just like Cade McIntyre, played small school ball in Florida, played both sides of the ball, was the cornerstone on both sides of the ball for his team. And what did we see from Stutzman last year? Humble three-star recruit. A lot of people didn't have super high expectations for him, at least not fans, certainly. No fan, I don't think. Uh, in June or July last year figured, oh yeah, that kid, Danny Stutzman, he's going to be one of the biggest problems on that entire Oklahoma defense by the end of his freshman season. And lo and behold, Stutzman becomes a freshman All-American. I'm not saying that's what you get out of Cade McIntyre, but I'm saying that's another guy where Oklahoma's fortunate to have him as well as Eric McCarty committed to just play football. You know, Wherever you mm -hmm. put those guys, you know they're going to compete. They're going to work their tails off and their natural bent for competition and just the way that they carry themselves and their mentality more than anything else is going to put them in a position to take meaningful snaps down the road at Oklahoma. Yeah. Um, you know, you, br you bring up uh, Danny Stutzman as a good analogy. I was going to say uh, Dan Cody and Ron L. Lewis, as far as small school guys that just so happen to be, you know, could play multiple positions. Uh, Dan Cody obviously ended up going to Ada, but he started out at Colgate and that's by, that's like very small school. I uh, transferred to Colgate, ended up shining. Uh, Ron Al Lewis, obviously from, I can't remember the exact name of the town. It was in Eastern Oklahoma over there by Beggs. And I was the eight man football, but he was so dominant and so athletic that you couldn't help but just offer the guy because he was just a freak. And obviously they both had really good careers at Oklahoma. So um, that, those type of guys tend to pan out 
when they come to Norman for some odd reason. I don't know what it is in the water, but they do. And I fully expect Cade McIntyre to pan out no matter where he comes, what position he ends up at as well. Um, I think that ought to do it for the recruiting aspect. Let's close it out. Obviously, the NBA draft's tomorrow, and I know people are talking about the NBA draft. If you're an Oklahoma City Thunder fan, which most people are that listen to this, or they're Dallas Mavericks fan, I know you guys are wanting to see exactly what your teams are going to do. Uh, Oklahoma City Thunder having the number two, the number 12, and the number 34 pick. They traded the 30th away. Um Chet Holmgren seems to be the uh, the main pick that everybody thinks Oklahoma City is going to get when it comes to the number two pick. Uh, obviously, Jabari Smith from Auburn, everybody thinks he's going to go Orlando number one, Chet Holmgren number two. They think – everybody thinks Oklahoma is going to try to move up and use the number 30, the number 12 pick to move up and try to get whether it's six through eight or four through eight or whatever so that they can go and get – uh, Jaden Ivey out of, I believe, Purdue. Purdue. Yeah, point guard, combo guard. Uh, really good player. Uh, I know if that happens, I'll be stoked as a Thunder fan. Uh, Dallas Mavericks, on the other hand, I don't even know if they have a pick. Like, I haven't really been paying much attention to there because everybody's been talking about uh, the, the Thunder and the Orlando Magic because of just – where they say they do not have a first round pick. Uh, the Dallas Mavericks. I don't even think they have a freaking pick at all in this draft. Goodness gracious. Well, they may have traded them away. I have not been paying attention to that, but anyways, yeah, I, the, the tomorrow night, 7 PM, it's be Thursday. You'll be listening to this today, 7 PM. Uh, the NBA draft will be on and uh, it should be fun. No matter who you're, Talking to you. I, I, do you do you pay attention to any of that stuff, Parker? Do I pay attention to it? Yes, but I'm not, not a, a Thunder like fan, I am, so yeah. I have I have a much more cynical opinion of Sam Presti and the OKC Thunder, which I'm going to spare you because it'll just mean we're here for another 45 minutes to an hour. Yeah, because it'll just piss me off, won't it? Yeah, yeah, probably it probably will. Okay, but fair enough. Yeah, no, they, Fair they, enough. I will say there's been some smoke lately that maybe the Mab Magic are playing coy and they're going to take Chet Holmgren at number one. I'll take Jabari Smith. That's who I wanted to begin with. Yeah. But Chet looks like he's a superstar. I look, I just want Oklahoma City to get that France dude in 2023 because he say they say he is the best prospect to come out in a generation. And if Oklahoma City can do that, yeah. along with Jabari or Chet and Jaden Ivey, you got SGA. You already got Josh Giddy. Giddy. I mean, oh my gosh, talk about a lineup, folks! And I know Lou Dort. Everybody thinks they're going to trade them. Part of the trade to move down in the draft. Uh, I would hate to see Lou Dort go, but I mean, I'm all for. Uh, look, Oklahoma City has like five first round draft picks over the next four years. So, like literally every year, they're like four or five picks in every draft. So <laughs> I'm just like. Who cares, man? They're going to be really good for a really long time. It, and uh, I'm pretty stoked about it. Whenever they make it to that point, let's go. Thunder up, baby. All right. I know that's all. that We're done. We're done. We're done. I'm done. I know there's a lot of people that are like, oh, talk about Oklahoma football and recruiting. I don't want to hear about this. But, hey, you guys are going to get my ear full about the NBA draft because I love the NBA. All right. Uh, that's going to do it for this version of the OU Inside. Do you have something you want to say real quick? Come to Omaha this weekend. It's a blast. Yeah, you probably I should. promise you. Probably you. Should. Hey, you want to know what? Um, this is the first time I've ever seen Parker literally talk up anything Nebraska. So if he's saying it's fun, it's fun. Listen, I tell you what, if you never come to Nebraska for any other reason than the College World Series, A, I understand it. B, that said, <laughs> come for the College World Series because it's a blast. And Fair it's enough. never it's never been more fun for me at least. Then this year, mostly because the team that I cover is two wins from a national championship. So, uh, yeah, if you're not already in Omaha, if you haven't already made plans to get to Omaha, the thing about Omaha and the thing about the College World Series is you get a team that's on a roll like the Sooners are on at the moment. A, you don't know when they're going to be back again. And I know that seems kind of like a cynical, harsh thing to say, but you really it is so hard to get it's here. True. You don't know when they're going to be back again, but also 
you want to enjoy it while you can. And you want to be able to savor it uh, as an Oklahoma Sooner fan. And so if you have, if I mean, if you have any availability in your schedule, any financial means by which to get up to Omaha this weekend and catch at least one game of the championship series, uh, trust me, it's not an experience you're going to want to miss. Agreed. Uh, would love to be up there. Uh, but kids sports kind of take precedent. Uh, anyways. Uh, but yeah, if you Oklahoma fans can do it, do it. Uh, this is awesome. It's been over a decade since the last time Oklahoma has been, and it could be over a decade again. You never know how it's going to play out. Like Parker said, so go up there, cheer on your Sooners and see where it goes from there, because there are only two games from winning a national title being the first program ever in NCAA history, winning a college world series in softball and in baseball. How about that? That would be pretty spectacular if you're an OU fan. All right, that's going to do it for this version of the OU Insider under the Visor Sooners podcast. Uh, if you're not a member of OU Insider, we just dropped a bunch of notes, Parker and I did, uh, over the 24 hours. I just got the chat going again. Uh, there's about 15, 16 questions I'm going to get to. By the end of it, it's usually like 150 that are done. I mean, I talk for a whole week to you guys. You ask questions, I answer, and it doesn't even have to be in the chat. Parker and I get in there and talk to you guys every day, multiple times a day, answer all your questions from recruiting, from college baseball, to basketball, to football, to team notes, to everything that we drop every week. If you've got questions, we've got answers, and we're there for you guys 24-7, 365. That's why we call it 247 Sports. Uh, right now, it's $75, gets you one year. After that first year, you get Paramount Plus. That is so big. So awesome. I know some people like stop selling Paramount Plus. Why? You know what you're going to get? You're going to get Top Gun Maverick. You get everything, all the Mission Impossibles. You get 1883. You get Tulsa King, which was filmed in Oklahoma. That's going to be starting in November with Stallone and a bunch of big cast members. They filmed it in Oklahoma City. They filmed it mostly in Oklahoma City, even though they called it Tulsa King. I thought that was kind of ironic. But they're filming a lot of these things in Oklahoma. They filmed 1883 in Texas and Oklahoma. I mean, dudes, you've got to start getting on Paramount Plus. It's very awesome. You're going to get 1931, which they're filming other stuff. Uh, it's another prequel to Yellowstone. Uh, it's going to be starting here pretty soon. Uh, you get all of uh, the the former Paramount, the, the CBS, all those sitcoms that dated back for all the NCIS is all the – Whatever you want to watch, if it's sports and it's on CBS, you've got it. If you got Comedy Central, Paramount Plus has got that for you. If you got FX, Paramount Plus has got that for you. If Viacom owns it and CBS owns it, it is on Paramount Plus, and it is awesome. Plus thousands of movies. I mean, so worth it. So $75 gets you one year of OU Insider, or you can try $1 for the first month, $9.95 afterwards. You don't get Paramount Plus with it. But you get OU Insider and you get all of 247 Sports, just like you do with the one-year allotment. If you want all 250 sites on 247 Sports, join us. Come be a member of OU Insider. Be in the know of all college sports, all recruiting. Uh, we'd love to have you. Uh, come PM us to, hey, man, I'm a new member. We'll get it going. Plus, during the season, we do giveaways. We give away tickets. I think we gave, we gave away like 40 or 50 tickets last year uh, to home games. It was pretty awesome. Uh, we give away prizes, whether it's $100 gift cards, whether it's an extension on your membership to OU Insider. We do it all for you guys so that you guys can continue to be around us and that you guys get to be rewarded for being members, not just getting questions and getting info. You get prizes from us. We do drawings and all kinds of stuff. So hope to see you guys on OUinsider.com VIP. Uh, for Parker Thune, my name is Brandon Drum. You guys have a blessed night. Make sure you watch Oklahoma. Make sure you go to Omaha if you can, and make sure you tune into the NBA draft. You guys have a blessed night. We will see you guys next week.